Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming, and welcome to those of you who have set foot in the uh, Lee Kishin Knowledge Institute here at St. Michael's Hospital for the very first time this morning. It's uh, a bit of a navigational challenge. I was making a, a point. It's the sort of blending of education and research in one place, but you sort of have to declare your allegiance when you come in the door. You're either education or research, because there's still an alleyway in between with a bridge. So um, if you can find the bridge, then we can figure out how to, how to bridge the gap. So. But that's uh, really one of the goals uh, here today and to uh, over the next day and a half. Um, we have an esteemed uh, guest speaker to uh, come and enlighten us and share some ideas uh, around competency-based education uh, with a view to helping inform the development of our uh, predominantly postgraduate programs, but education programs uh, writ large here at the University of Toronto. Uh, so many of you are familiar with, uh, with the name of Ali Tenkadi. He's uh, a pioneer in competency-based uh, medical education, uh, but also in a number of other things. Um, Dr. Tenkadi studied medicine at the University of Amsterdam and uh, subsequently completed a PhD with a dissertation on peer teaching in medical education. Between 1980 and 1999, he was closely involved in all of the University of Amsterdam's major preclinical and clinical curriculum reforms, educational research, program evaluation, and educational development. In 1999, he was appointed full professor of medical education at Utrecht University. From 1999 until 2005, he was associate dean of education at the University Medical Center in Utrecht. And since 2005, he leads the Center for Research and Develop, uh, Development of Education at UMCU. His research interests include vertical integration in the undergraduate medical curriculum, peer teaching and competency-based postgraduate medical education. And since 2010, he has an attachment as a regular visiting professor of medical education at the University of California, San Francisco. So with that, and with the view to looking forward to linking competency-based education to clinical practice, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ali Tinkati. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored to be here and uh, to uh, speak to you um, about uh, uh, EPAs, about uh, linking uh, competency-based education to clinical practice using untrustable professional activities. And I'll start to show you a little bit where I come from. The microphone is on, is that okay? Um, you, um, it's interesting to hear that some of you are for the first time in the Lika Singh Center, because I'm here for the second time actually, so <laughs> I'm probably more familiar here. But, um, uh, who of you have been in the Netherlands? Uh, okay, so you are uh, probably familiar with the, uh, with, uh, the fact that Utrecht is, did I, here, this is actually the first slide, Utrecht is, um, in the center of the, the Netherlands and all the stars that you see are medical schools. Uh, so we have uh, eight medical schools in the Netherlands. Maastricht is for education well known. Groningen, some people may know. And we have some symbols that you might recognize from the <laughs> Netherlands, right? Yeah. Well, we're good on that one here. Yeah, you are, yes. Yeah. Uh, this is University Medical Center. Um, uh, uh, and this is the, uh, the new education building, uh, and my office is in the fourth floor. And I know uh, Warren Rubenstein, who is in the audience, has spent a few months in this building. But I would like to sh show you just a few pictures uh, at twilight uh, of what the building looks like. And it's interesting that the architect, when he built this building, had in mind uh, it must be a building for biomedical education. So we have a medical course, we have bi biomedical sciences course, and he thought, why do I make a, a building that resembles a, a human body with lungs and a cardiovascular system? Uh, so here you see huge uh, glass columns that uh, extend throughout the whole building, and actually they are they have a function in uh, uh, how do you say they uh, get the air up uh, in in the building. And in the bottom, you see these red colors that kind of resembles what the cardiovascular system. If you take on the fourth floor, here, here around here is where our offices are. We we'll look down, you see these staircases going down. And from the bottom, it looks like this. So th those are the vessels. OK. So we're, this, this, the stage is now set about <laughs> medical education. Uh, my schedule for the today and tomorrow, and I, I, I'm not sure if you would be visiting also uh, some other uh, moments that I will be talking here, but just to give you an overview this morning, I would like to talk about the principles of com competence-based medical education and EPAs. 
this afternoon, there is a workshop on designing EPAs more in detail. How do you do that? Tomorrow in the morning, uh, I'll be talk talking about self-determination theory. It's a motivational theory. And how do you apply that to medical education? And in the, uh, later in the morning, um, we'll have actually uh, a, a large session that was announced as um, teaching peers as an educational philosophy. But I, when I was preparing about EPAs, I thought there is uh, some topics that I would uh, love to share with you uh, even beyond the, the more practical things that we are doing today. So I suggest that we split that um, period in two, two shorter workshops, one on the wider significance of EPAs and one on, um, on teaching peers as a philosophy in education. So back to competency-based medical education, and I'm sure that um, a lot of what I've been saying is things that you have been thinking of. You are one of the centers who have actually been working on competency-based medical education very much. Um, so just to see if I can connect with uh, your, your background knowledge, I'll just start kind of general um, introduction in what it actually is and what also the problems might be. Now, if you look at the dictionary uh, about what actually is uh, competent or competence or competency, um, if you look at the dictionary, Web Webster's Dictionary, for instance, it says that having pre uh, requisite or adequate ability or qualities, being legally qualified and adequate, and having a capacity to function or develop. And uh, specific, the first two are interesting. It's a combination of people having skills, but also having um, being qualified or legally qualified to do so. Uh, you, you, uh, something can be a competent body. Uh, and I, I like that combination. I will come back to that. So if you look at competency, it's the ability to do something, but also the qualification to act or judge. Um, so actually, if you combine that, it's sufficient ability and right to judge or act. I will come back to that combination concept when we talk about EPAs. Um, if you look at uh, just a very short history um, of competency-based medical education, specifically in postgraduate education, I think around the world, and I'm, now, I'm sure in, in Canada also, in the, in the 90s, there was some dissatisfaction with the current um, postgraduate training models. Uh, also in the Netherlands, we had the same discussions too. And uh, so in the, uh, here's where you, the ca Canadians, came up with the CanMeds model. And uh, as you, uh, well, I'll come back to it. So the Canadian model uh, was in parallel also um, elaborated in the United States. And when I, I frequently talk with uh, Jason Frank, uh, he keeps saying to me that actually the ACGME model was actually taken from the CanMeds model. And I talked to, to the ACGME people and they would never kind of recognize that. So I'm not sure about what happened there. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, apart from uh, the, uh, the, uh, the British system, that, uh, there's also some different models in the, in the British system. I think the Canadian model actually has uh, conquered the world very much so, uh, at least in the Netherlands. Um, and I happen to be uh, an education advisor of our Central College of Medical Specialties early in uh, the 2000s. And um, they were also thinking of uh, redesigning postgraduate training and I just had met Jason Frank in an in a, in a international conference and I said, why don't we see if the Kenmans model can be something for the Dutch? And this is actually what happened. And then we flew him over to the Netherlands. He had talked a few times that we actually, in the Netherlands, adopted the Kenmans model. Uh, not only in the Netherlands, but many other countries actually. And this is, this is not limitative. I'm, I'm sure there's more countries that are being interested in, in the Kenmans model. Why is competency-based medical education actually a, a paradigm shift? <coughs> uh, I think there's two distinct reasons why it's different from what we did in the past. One is actually that medical competence is more broadly defined. And I think that was the first reason to, do, to think of a broader set of competencies. It's that the medical competence has, has actually been redefined um, across all these countries that use these frameworks. The second thing is actually the focusing on actual competence and not just on the idea of working and waiting until training time is over and then receiving 
certificate or license. Um, the second one was actually um, used uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the, the US model where the ACG we had this project called the Outcome Project. Um, I, don't, I can't find that back on their website anymore. I don't know why they took it off, but the idea of outcome uh, is also very significant in competency-based training. I think these two features make that um, um, competency-based medical education different from what we did in the past. And how it, is it usually operationalized? You, you know this, uh, so usually competencies are proposed by an authoritative body, uh, people that are very, um, th those wise people that sit together and say, well, this is a nice model. Then agreement is sought among stakeholders. Um, this was very extensively done with the uh, Kenmets model. And I think with the redesign of the Canadian model now, these past years, uh, another um, wave of um, uh, uh, looking uh, broadly on redesigning is, uh, is done again. But then if agreement is found, uh, competencies are further detailed in a framework and then and finally teaching and assessment is tailored to that framework. So that looks perfect. Now I don't have to explain this to you. Uh, the seven roles, each role has key competencies and, and each key competency has several enabling competencies and there's elements too. But actually if you look at the, the approach that is taken usually is an, I would call this an analytic approach. So when you first start to define what is a doctor, that people kind of know what a doctor is, but not specifically yet. Then it's decomposed in, in, in seven roles, uh, which usually people find very, uh, has a high face validity. People find that very natural to think of these roles are uh, as part of what a current medical specialist and actually if it's across medical specialties, it's also the model of a doctor in general, uh, what it is. People like that. But then uh, it is not sufficient to operationalize that for medical training and assessment. So you need more detailing. This is why you need sub-competencies. But even the sub-competencies are not de detailed enough. So you need even more of those. So actually what you end up with, and you probably all know this, uh, so there is, if you look at the the KenMeds 2005 framework, it has seven roles, 134 elements, 28 key competencies, and 125 enabling competencies. You, you, all, you are Canadians, you all know these, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, okay. So you feel my criticism a little bit, right? Um, which is, uh, there is a famous um, psychologist in the 50s, uh, 1956, published a paper called The Working Memory of Human Beings Can Contain Seven Plus or Minus uh, Two Elements at a Time. So seven is actually a very nice number to p have people remember things. But if you go beyond seven, uh, you need support. I mean, you need that drawer back in your uh, desk uh, to take that document and think of all the other key competencies. Um, and if you look at the, how the model was actually built, um, and in, uh, think of that analytic procedure that it was made. Uh, there's, from the manager role, there's 21 elements. For instance, collaborative decision making, health, human resources, negotiation. These are listed as elements. Um, there's four key competencies. And number three, for instance, is physicians are able to allocate finite health care resources appropriately. You see, the further you get, the longer the sentences become. Um, there's 13 enabling competencies. So 3.1 would be physicians are able to recognize important just allocation of healthcare resources, balance the effectiveness, efficiency, and access with optimal care. And um, these are highly important elements. I mean, nobody would, um, uh, uh, everybody would actually uh, would, would agree with that. That is, a, that is important. But um, if you think of it, the system gets a little bit complicated. If several sub-competencies are actually under the management role, could also be placed under another role as collaborator or communicator professional, all these elements. Uh, so the framework is, is very complex, actually. If you see that everything um, has to do with every other thing. So in conclusion, actually, the CAMAS model is a terrific document, and I think it is an example. It, it serves as an example throughout the world. People, 
really like it. It has a high face value and acceptability, but there is some problems with it. There's too much to comprehend for individuals. And um, if you need that document to carry it with you all your life because you don't know exactly what's, it, you have to refer to it all the time, um, that is kind of difficult. Um, the more detailed it gets, the less easy it is to remember. And it, it gets some suboptimal suitability for, for training and assessment. Or so there is critics, and if you look at the literature, people have written about it. As some say that the sum of a professional can do is far greater than the parts can be described in competency terms. Specifically, if you think of that analytic model, it's a reductionist approach. Some people say it's useless for assessing profession in the broader sense. I'm not sure if I agree with these people, but if you look at how you operate it, it, it you get some difficulties. There is maybe too many competencies and subcompetencies. There's a connection with the healthcare practice. We have to be aware that it doesn't get lost from that. Competencies should not become a list of tick boxes that are not really fully understood by the tickers. Mm -hmm. uh, those actually do that because they don't really grasp exactly what all these things mean and then enforce the regulations become a bureaucracy because you'd have to do that. And then it's kind of overwhelmed the fun of clinical teaching. If, if you think we need to do this and I'm not really sure whether this resident actually um, meets all these criteria but I have no reason to say no so why I'd say yes or you're not really sure what you're doing and uh, all these paperworks that must be um, handed over. Maybe some time, some of your time could be spent better. Um, so if you read this, and I've been thinking about that also actually from the beginning when we started working with the Kenmatz model in the Netherlands. Uh, how can we get, actually be sure that we get back to what actually um, medical competence is? Uh, here is a, a quote from Epstein and 100, which actually shows that how things actually come together at all. The habitual and, and judicious use of communication, knowledge and technical skills, clinical reasoning emotions, values, and reflection about everything in the world comes together in daily practice for the benefit of individual and the community being served. Uh, you don't want to decompose all these things, actually. So why uh, use untrustable professional activities? How did we start? Get, first, get back to what actually the competency-based medical education is. It should be outcome-based, not process-based. That's, that's for sure. The focus of competence should be on integration of knowledge, skills, and attitude. They should, they always come together. There's, there's an unnatural separation if you take these apart. Um, the idea is actually time independence. But it, so if you are serious about graduating people because they are competent, you should acknowledge that people are different. And it's not one day exactly. If you start, uh, I'm not sure if your resident starts on July 1st, uh, but uh, so after so many years uh, you end on one day and then you kind of assume that everybody meets the same standards. Is that really true? Um, so actually there is a need for individualization. Look different at different persons. I think competency-based medical education is particularly applicable in workplace learning. This is not what we think of in huge classes. People take the same test. We can do that at the same time. but. If you think on how people develop in a working place, in clinic, uh, people are different and maybe education should be tailored and the assessment of competence should be tailored to them. So a better definition of competence, <coughs> we had a discussion in the Netherlands uh, on competency-based education, not particularly in medicine, but actually in other places uh, of, uh, of education. And this um, actually expert group came up <coughs> with a very useful definition. They said the competency should be context related and specific, should integrate, should be durable, uh, but be a, a competency is a, as a quality that people take with them for years. It should be related to tasks or activities, should be learnable and trainable, it should be related to <coughs> other competencies and it should be evaluable, testable, or observable. And they are meant to prepare students for the labor market. Um, 
Now, if you think of the uh, EPA definition, it has many of these elements in it. The idea of an EPA is a core unit of professional work that is being identified as a task to be entrusted to a journey once sufficient competency of competence has been reached. So it's part, we, I detailed that definition in a publication in medical education. It's part of essential professional work in a given context. So it's also somewhat context bound. Uh, it requires adequate knowledge, skills and attitude, generally acquired through training. It leads to recognized output of professional labor, usually confined to only qualified personnel. That's when you would call it an EPA. It's independently executable within a time frame. So you could do, do this tomorrow morning or will or take next week to do it. Or So there is a beginning and an end. Um, it's observable and measurable <coughs> in its process and its outcome. So you can so t say to someone, you did this well, or you could also see that result is, um, meets our standards. And it reflects one or more domains of the competence to be acquired. So if you have a framework, and let me start, or let me actually explicitly say that it's not a replacement of a competency framework, but it's actually um, a tool to translate a competency framework to the workplace. So you'd actually connect it with the domains of competence that you think are important. So if you th think of that model, it's actually what happens, it's actually a more synthetic approach. So what you do is an EPA is actually something that you're doing. I mean, you're doing Monday morning at, at 8 o'clock or you're sitting here listening to something. Well, this is not clinical work, but uh, there's many <coughs> clinical tasks. And if you look at these tasks, you will see that many of these elements actually are part of the task. They come together in the task. And just to make sure that there is a difference between competencies and EPAs. Competencies are actually descriptors of a person. They are qualities of a person. So it's knowledge, skills, attitude, values, or I could say content expertise. And here are things that you would recognize from the framework. EPAs are actually work descriptors. There, so it's, it's a way to describe your work. It's essential part, so it could be discharge of a patient, counseling a patient, or leading a family meeting, or resuscitate a meeting. So these are parts, um, uh, part of what actually happens. So if you put these elements in a grid with two dimensions, we're talking still about the same things. Eh? We're talking about the chemist competency roles, but if you have activities or <coughs> I think the Canadians, you call this acts, right? That's, that would be okay too. Um, you would see, and this is just very schematic, and you, you, if you would redesign this, you, you have the dots maybe in different places, but what you actually see is all of these um, EPAs actually reflect multiple competency domains, and, multiple, and many of these sub competencies or whatever you have detailed there. So the problem actually is, or the, the, the idea is that if you would look at these activities, you could readily observe them and you could ask, you could train people or ask people to observe what people do in practice. Um, and if you do that and you have covered most of your practice in EPAs uh, and you find that people do them well, uh, you could kind of assume or infer that these competency domains are present. And that is easier than if you would look at these competency domains and try to score those or evaluate those as separate competency domains or sub-competencies. You keep doing that all the time. For some reason, at the end of the day, you might still not be uncomfortable saying that people can do this exactly. So why not focus on this and actually, and if you focus on it, you could still think of these elements that you have defined as important components uh, of these activities, but then kind of in, as infer that these are present. And actually, if you, if you are satisfied with this, this is just kind of the justification. Uh, it's not re really necessary to have scores here. Um, now, if you look at an EPA, and we've, we've been working in, in with several groups on, on detailing EPAs, what it exactly is and 
Uh, one group that I worked with, and we actually elaborate this model with a, with a group uh, of physician assistants uh, in the Netherlands who uh, have, it's a, it's a new profession in the Netherlands, uh, much newer than the North America, but um, the Utrecht uh, um, program for physician assistant training has, is now fully based on EPAs. And so we elaborated how, what actually, how is an EPA detailed? How, how do you write that? And this will be also the, uh, uh, the program for, uh, for the workshop today. Uh, so a full EPA description includes a short title that is understandable, that people really know what it is. There must be a description actually to uh, give um, specifics and limitations of uh, when people are trusted to do this, what exactly are, are they trusted to do. Then knowledge, skills and attitude need to ex execute the EPA. Then the CANMED's framework competencies that apply to this, so actually you're building that grid then. And then sources of, oh, sources of information, oh, here we are. Sources of information that determine progress. Uh, so when you design these EPAs, you have to first think of how are we, how do we evaluate persons on their progress for this EPA? And how do we found a formal entrustment decision? And a entrustment decision actually says that if you meet standards, we trust you to do this unsupervised. Uh, it's a critical um, moment in, in training that you would do this. And then um, finally, it is nice to, to, to think of what difference does it make if you trust a person to do this? How where, will their role differ if a, you have a trainee uh, as, who is trusted to do something unsupervised? Will a person will do that? Will will this person be scheduled to do that uh, with just uh, super uh, very very supervision on a distance? You could say. Um, so, to summarize, uh, EPAs are building blocks to link competency framework to a clinical practice. Um, it's not an alternative for competencies. Um, EPAs delineate what must be done in healthcare. Uh, they, competencies describe the training qualities that are needed to execute EPAs. And uh, the assessment, uh, it's actually don't focus on competence, but foc on, focus on EPAs would be my advice. So uh, now, <coughs> when would a person be called uh, competent? And that, that is important because uh, we, when you have that framework uh, using EPAs, uh, the significance of the EPAs would be when you would actually take that decision or entrustment decision uh, for a person. And if you think of competencies, um, of competence as, as, a, as a level of development, um, you could say that when a professional activity is mastered on a threshold level that permits trust to act unsupervised. And one of the, the better examples that uh, everybody readily understand is uh, the driver's license uh, uh, example. So you have, you know that people uh, need to meet standards and when once they meet that standard, they can drive a car unsupervised. It doesn't mean they, they have perfect competence yet and we, in the Netherlands at least, it may be true in Canada, that I think most accidents happen with people who have just had their driver's license with the younger people. Um, but uh, society actually accepts uh, that if they meet that threshold level, they can do this unsupervised. This is what you would want to do in healthcare too. Uh, when people meet that standard, you say, this is the moment that we trust you to do this unsupervised because we've seen that you would take enough measures when something goes wrong or something. So we, we actually trust you to do this. So actually competence is then a stage in a continuum of development. And uh, if you look at it, this is graph, this is how people acquire skills usually. If this is their competence <coughs> and this is the time, um, you'd probably see that usually uh, a, a rapid increase of competence starts here. And over time they get better uh, with a longer time. And there's, there's different examples from studies that show uh, the similar graphs. Um, here, the quality <coughs> of <coughs> cases seen by internists. 
your uh, increase of skill as an anesthetist. So if you think of this model, um, there is a psychologist, Dreyfus and Dreyfus, who uh, designed uh, a model of, of growing uh, stages of um, development of persons in their skills, and they call this a novice, advanced, beginner, a competent, proficient, and expert levels. And if this competent level, if you think of it and take this graph, here is actually where you would consider training to be uh, ending. It doesn't mean that people don't keep acquiring their skills or, or keep improving their skills, uh, but they probably need professional practice and, pro and specifically deliberate professional practice. Then they will still um, grow higher. And you know, the, uh, in, in different fields like uh, in music or sports, or people ha uh, have attained a level but keep get, getting better all the time. And it takes a long time before they are at the, at the very top master level. But here is actually a moment that you would probably consider we would trust this person to, to work unsupervised now. <coughs> um, so uh, if you think of a, uh, just take one trainee in mind and uh, think of an EPA and, and see this graph. But there could be another EPA uh, that would be um, easier, for instance. So, so you'd have a higher level on an earlier stage because it could be different reasons for that, because it's easier or because it happens more often, you have get more practice, or could be different reasons for it. There could be an EPA that uh, doesn't happen in the first year, for instance. You never do that in the first year, so you start later. Or there could be even one that you have already uh, prior knowledge and skills before you start training. And if you <coughs> draw that line, you'd actually see that there's different moments during training that people uh, could be trusted to do something unsupervised. So a justified entrustment decision, if you really closely look at people, could be done on different moments. Um, this is one trainee, but you imagine that could be another trainee who had the, things, the same things at different moments. And um, it could be uh, different because they're in a different place, so it could be a different hospital, or the persons are different, they have personal different backgrounds, and so they could be different. If you watch them closely, they're not going to be at the same level the same day all specifically you know, with all these EPAs. So it's kind of silly to say that after three, four, or five years, whenever postgraduate training ends, we now assume that you can do things unsupervised <coughs> at this moment. It's actually, if you think of it, it is, it is not a very natural way to, to educate people. <clears throat> now, if you think of this, the Dreyfus stages, there is another way to operationalize those stages. That is, how much supervision would you think is needed? Um, and there's, we have defined five levels. And the first level is actually that, the, that you would say that the person is not allowed to do things. They may have knowledge, and, but we're, we're still not, they're still not ready to do things. The second level would be uh, to practice with things on full supervision. Um, in surgical um, situations, surgical disciplines, uh, that just means that you're there and looking exactly. You could uh, take over whenever it's needed. Third level would be practice <coughs> without, with supervision on demand. So a person would not have to be exactly present to take over uh, if needed, but could be available within minutes to take over. And we sometimes call that, um, the first, this one is proactive supervision, where uh, the supervisor actually determines how much supervision is given. And this could be reactive supervision, so you react to the person who asks for supervision. So it is a significant difference because here you would have a, you start having some trust that people will, will call you, but you're available in a, uh, actually fairly quickly. Here is unsupervised practice. You could also say in, in a training situation there will be some sort of supervision, but it could be supervision on a distance. But here's where you like to um, take a, an important decision of unsupervised practice. We sometimes call that a star, a statement of awarded responsibility. And that comes back to the definition that you have seen in the, one of the first slides, sufficient ability and right to act. So you grant a right to a person because you think the person is able to act. 
There could be even a fifth level. Supervision may be given by this person. Uh, and specifically with, with chief residents, uh, they give a lot of supervision. And you, you would even trust them to give supervision. So actually, it, what this all says is that competency-based medical education requires flexibility. There's intra-trainee variation with different EPAs. There's inter-trainee variation because the residents differ in their prior knowledge and skills, learning ability, general attitude. There's contact, context variation. Uh, the one hospital is different from an, another hospital because of epidemiology, facilities, or culture, or education-mindedness of staff. So this is a reason why competency-based medical education makes sense, to me at least, in, in, uh, as opposed to the one-size-fits-all type of training that we had for ages, actually. And working with EPAs can facilitate this model. Here's an example of uh, the uh, physician assistant training program that, um, that I talked about earlier. Um, now, physician assistants in the Netherlands, at least, the model is that people are hired by um, a clinical department, usually, to alleviate clinical tasks, to take over clinical tasks. So the, the idea of entrustment of clinical critical tasks is very much applicable for physician assistants. At the same time, all these departments differ. So the, the program for physician assistants is very individual. This is one individual curriculum for one person actually mapped out at the beginning of their training. And here is a, a workplace in, in a neurology department. This is five EPAs, yeah? it's no more or less than five EPAs for, the, for that two and a half year program. Um, the program was actually organized in blocks of, of 10 weeks. So there's 10 blocks of 10 weeks. Uh, and here is the levels of supervision that are planned beforehand. Now the, the system is flexible. So every 10 weeks there is a talk of our, eh, with that trainee to determine whether they are on track or not. And it could be that this level four is reached in block seven or block five, whatever, depending on how skillful, how, eh, what the progress of that person is. And from then on, actually they can do that unsupervised and they will do it unsupervised and they actually grow into that profession of being a physician assistant. Um, so uh, when they graduate at the end, that's not the moment where they suddenly can do everything. It's actually a gradual, gradual grow into that profession. Here's another example uh, from Academic Medicine, a pro uh, publication of last year, where uh, the pediatricians start working with EPAs. You see the same things actually there. Here on the three years, it's mapped when the levels of supervision are expected to be reached. And here's uh, the link with the competency frameworks of the ACGME. So to summarize, the competency-based medical education, uh, competency-based medical education works, but <coughs> only I think it works best or when competencies are linked to what must be done in healthcare very clearly. Um, and the working with EPA requires listing of EPAs with content validity for training. So you'd need groups of people that sit together and say, well, this is actually what our profession looks like um, translated into EPAs. A description of each EPA is in sufficient detail and agreement um, among important stakeholders. Uh, formalization of entrustment decisions and a gradual decrease of supervision levels up to the unsupervised practice level. Um, they, EPAs can serve transparency for trainees, directors, and the public also. It's a very transparent type of modeling, so people will actually know. And if you could negotiate that with uh, even um, insurance companies or, or legal bodies to say, well, we have really observed this person to do this part, and why not do this, and why not actually consider them to be gradually become a specialist instead of suddenly overnight at the end of training. So it is flexibility of length and breadth of training, evaluation and assessment is more easily geared to EPAs than to competencies. And it also could serve patient safety if you do that well, because um, you would only trust a person if you think it's safe for patients. So it, it is a way to also authorize patient safety. 
that's actually um, my message for this morning.